Welcome everyone to the next uh, chapter, the next webinar in the document database series. Today is going to be a very special event, something we did not do uh, earlier. Let me talk about uh, that uh, later. Um, <clears throat> those who are new to the document database community, this webinar series runs for almost a year now and uh, we had great talks around document databases and uh, uh, we heard uh, various different viewpoints on how the document database um, market and the technology itself should uh, look like and we are uh, aiming to uh, have even more talks even uh, more topics uh, presented to you uh, in this in this series my name is Peter Farkas. Uh, usually I'm the host of uh, the Document Database webinars. I have Alexei Palaschenko with me. We are the co-founders of FerretDB, which is a, an open source MongoDB alternative. And the reason why this webinar is a special one is because we usually don't talk much about FerretDB in the Document Database community. The Document Database community is... Um, is vendor independent anyone uh, in the community can uh, submit proposals for a talk and uh, we tend to accept them regardless whether that is good for FerretDB or or not and we would like to keep it this way however since FerretDB approaches the two-year mark since its inception we thought that we are going to um, hold this fireside chat with Alexi to talk about why we started FerretDB, um, uh, where uh, do we see uh, uh, MongoDB as a technology um, in the future and some status update on FerretDB itself as a product. So this is going to be a special one, uh, as I said, and I hope uh, you will enjoy it. Quick reminder, it is possible to ask questions throughout the webinar, and you can do that via Slack, YouTube, LinkedIn or uh, via Zoom chat. We will be monitoring all of these channels and we would be more than happy to answer your questions after the presentation. However, since this is a fireside chat, we may also uh, include uh, some of the audience members. If you raise your hand, you would be able to, to um, ask questions live as well or, or, or make uh, comments. So uh, the agenda for today, we will introduce ourselves. Uh, we will talk about the state of the document database market, which sounds super serious and businessy, but actually it's going to be about technology and about um, what developers expect from databases in general and how document databases can go towards that towards that expectation. We're going to discuss MongoDB as a potential open standard, uh, then some intro to FerretDB, and the status of FerretDB, the history of FerretDB, and, um, and then uh, we will be discussing very openly the roadmap ahead of us for the product itself. Alexi, uh, why don't you uh, say some words about uh, yourself as an introduction, and then we can take it forward. Yeah, I'm Alexey Palashenko, co-founder and CTO of FerlDB company, founder of the FerlDB product. I worked at Percona for several years. I worked on Percona monitoring and management product. That's basically a solution to monitor your database performance. I worked on, on uh, Talos project at Sidera Linux company, which is, was a uh, Linux cloud name. Linux-based cloud native operative system for running containers on Kubernetes, exciting stuff. But after that, I decided to return to the database space to work on FerroDB. Yes, great. Uh, my intro will be a bit shorter uh, uh, since uh, I did this intro uh, many times. My name is Peter Farkas. I'm the CEO and co-founder of uh, FerretDB, I worked at uh, Percona and Cloudera before and some other open source companies. And I've spent the last 15 years around databases. So that's why I feel strongly about 
databases and uh, open source, I think these go uh, hand in hand. And we did not work together at uh, Percona Alexi. We are both ex-Perconians, but we actually never had the chance to work together at Percona uh, itself. We got uh, introduced uh, to each other by Peter Zaitsev, our third co-founder, who is well known for uh, being the founder and former CEO of Percona, the database consulting company. And I guess he, um, having him as a co-founder and uh, also him being, uh, him being uh, also very much into uh, open source and databases helps us to shape the future of uh, FerretDB and think alongside of uh, a lot alongside of um, what needs to be achieved uh, with databases and uh, open source and what customers or users like as a as a product. So these are us, the three uh, uh, co-founders of uh, of FerretDB. So. Uh, Alexi, feel free to chime in if you have uh, different uh, thoughts on whatever I'm going to talk about. But we often get the question, why did we start FerretDB? What is the problem we are trying to address? Why would we even need a MongoDB alternative? So I usually, um, I usually use this slide to explain what we are looking at when it comes to databases and popular databases. As you can see on the slide, uh, the Stack Exchange Developer Survey of 2022 shows that, that uh, um, most developers, this is a survey which was conducted among 65K developers, so it's rather extensive. Uh, it shows that there are a couple of databases which developers are very much interested in. Uh, the popularity of MySQL, Postgres, and SQLite is uh, not even a question, uh, everybody knows uh, these technologies, and these are the most important relational databases out there. And if you look at, look at it, MongoDB is the fourth most popular uh, database technology developers want to engage with. And there is actually one great difference between MySQL, Postgres, and SQLite versus MongoDB. What 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 is that, uh, Alexi? That's of course the license. That MongoDB nowadays is not open source, unlike MySQL, PostgreSQL, SQLite is famously on the public domain. Redis actually the most recent release of Redis are under open source license MIT, but all extensions are not. So let's talk about the license. Yeah, so MongoDB was released many years ago, but uh, a few years ago, they changed the license to what they call server-side public license, their own, uh, own license they wrote them themselves. They took a AGPL version 3 and changed a few key bits. And this key bits is basically if you make the functionality of the program available to third parties as a service, you must make the service source code available to everyone under the terms of this license. So typically it's abbreviated, like if you make a functional program available as a cloud service, you should open source it. But that's not quite true because the terms in the licenses itself are quite broad. So available to third party as a service, they use this phrase they very like, like includes without limitation. And there are a lot of things that are not exactly like when you think about it is available as a cloud service. So definition is very, very broad. And then the service source code includes not only the source code of the program itself, but also all things related to it, everything it touches. So for example, if say I made a cloud CRM system and it uses MongoDB as a backend, uh, the primary purpose of CRM program is to store data. The primary purpose of MongoDB as a database is to store data. The definition of available service includes like, if the primary purpose is small or the same. So we could say it's small or the same. And then the service source code includes uh, all the things I wrote for this service, including CRM code itself. And that's, of course, unreasonable. And this spell is not considered to be an open source license. It's not approved by open source initiative because it doesn't fit open source definition. 
It uh, also has concerns from Free Software Foundation, of course. And what is interesting is that uh, AGPL license text itself is copyrighted by Free Software Foundation, and uh, it might be possible that MongoDB as a company even breaches the copyright for the license text itself. That's something I learned recently, and yeah, it would be interesting to see if there would be some development on that front or not. So SSPR license is very work. People don't understand it in general because, like, again, most people think it's, like, very simple and you just don't have to run MongoDB as a cloud service like AWS, but companies that actually have lawyers don't try uh, avoid SSPL as a plug because, like, it's not completely unclear what the risks are. And the simplest way to mitigate this risk is to just pay to MongoDB as a company and get a commercial license, but then you have a very explicit vendor lock-in. You can't choose any other vendor. There are no alternative to MongoDB if, if it's self-host or MongoDB Atlas if you use a cloud version. And pricing is not suitable for many small businesses because MongoDB is a public company and Atlas more or less the only way they make money right now. So what we want, uh, to, so and other cloud providers want to provide MongoDB alternatives. They could not provide the modern version of MongoDB. They, they need to develop something themselves or they could ask us and use FileDB. So, so just to summarize, if I have a service provider, for example, I run a service provider and, and I want to provide MongoDB as a service, I can't do that due to the SSPL license, right? Well, you could always use an uh, old version, which no longer receives security updates, doesn't have modern features and so on. Yeah. <laughs> or you could go and ask MongoDB ni nicely for uh, for price and they most likely tell you, no, you can't. And what does, this, what does this mean to the, to the uh, end user? So... Basically, basically, there is this notion nowadays. There is this uh, there is this understanding that cloud providers um, cloud providers are uh, sometimes uh, evil and they are taking open source projects and they are not paying for it while they are providing it as a service. So limiting the ability for service providers to to um, to provide MongoDB as a service is supposed to be good for the user, no? Yeah, but then we will have like only one provider which could do whatever they want. So that like your vendor locked in, you could not choose any other vendor. And if MongoDB stock price goes down, they will just raise the price to make more money. And then you are in the bind. You don't have any way to, any way to go. So it might be like you, if you... MongoDB, of course, you want to make all the money. Mm -hmm. And if you sympathize with MongoDB, you probably want them to have all the money. But as a user, it's much better for the user to have some choices, to have uh, to, to have multiple vendors so you can choose based on pricing and availability and additional features and support and so on. So on. Because like many vendors in the same place typically make it much better for the customer. I see. So basically, SSPL at at first glance sounds really bad for service providers because they can't provide MongoDB as a service. But at the end of the day, is the users who will have less choice when it comes to what provider can 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 use for their uh, MongoDB MongoDB database uh, needs. Well, okay. So let's go back uh, a little and look at this uh, um, uh, chart again. So as we can see, relational databases are rather democratic where SQL could be used across many different products, many different uh, flavors are, are there for the user to choose. And, uh, and sometimes these flavors serve very different use cases as well. For example, Postgres and SQLite are very different in terms of where these are usually uh, utilized. Uh, SQLite is much better, or traditionally it has been much better for embedded use cases or um, 
use case is not needing a lot of performance and Postgres and MySQL were serving other types of needs. And of course, there are proprietary SQL uh, implementations like, like Oracle, for example, serving enterprise needs only. So there are a lot of options there and a lot of innovation around SQL. And then we have MongoDB, which is right now is just MongoDB. And that's what you can use. That's what you should be using. So why do we have this difference between relational databases and document databases? And bear with us, this is the thought process we used to uh, finally end up starting uh, FaradDB. And uh, this thought process includes taking a look at the history of SQL so we can understand what happened with SQL, what happened around SQL, which enabled this uh, level of innovation uh, around uh, relational databases. So let's look at this short story of SQL. And this is by no means uh, um, historically uh, uh, always um, <clears throat> accurate. This is meant to be a very short history of SQL. And of course, there's a lot more to it, but for the sake of a uh, short discussion on it, let me go through very quickly. So how SQL started is that there was a person named Edgar uh, called at IBM Research Labs. IBM came up with SQL. IBM came up with relational databases and this person Mr. Codd, he came up with the, with the concept of relational databases in, in general. Uh, before relational databases, there were different, uh, like uh, three like approaches to how a database should look like. And he came up with, uh, came up with the concept, which we call the relational model. He also called it the relational model. Which, uh, which is now the uh, prevalent um, way of uh, storing, storing uh, large amounts of, of data. But the query language itself was not something which the relational model came with in the beginning. What the relational model came with is a query language was an extremely complicated way of basically having to write a separate program in order to extract data from the database. And of course, that was very hard to use by someone who is not a mathematician or, or a software developer, or perhaps both. Back then, you, you kind of had to be uh, both. So uh, other IBM uh, employees, Don Chamberlain and Ray Boyce, they came up with the foundations of SQL, which is meant to be a query language to enable relational databases to become more usable by the end user. And by the end user, we still don't mean the level of simplicity as what we have today, but at least a much easier way to query the, the database. So in the early 70s, these two gentlemen came up with the foundations of SQL, um, which uh, uh, was supposed to make it very easy to adopt uh, a relational database um, for end users. Very interesting, but uh, sad uh, part of the story is that Ray Boyce was only, I think, 25 years old uh, when they published the first paper with uh, Don Chamberlain on SQL, and he died uh, shortly after that due to brain aneurysm. So Ray Boyce never learned about the uh, substantial um, contribution uh, they, they had, the two of them, uh, when it comes to the world of databases. So with the relational model and with SQL walking hand in hand, IBM released multiple relational database products. I think the most well-known was IBM DB2, and they came with uh, IBM hardware. So you had to buy this washing machine sized or multiple washing machine sized machines in order to be able to use SQL as a query language or IBM's relational database, uh, the revolutionary new concept uh, of uh, an approach to, to, uh, to uh, databases in general. That meant that this was a vendor lock-in situation. If you liked SQL, if you liked the product, you had to use IBM. There was no other way around it. Nothing else existed which uh, could um, 
which could provide the same kind of uh, simplicity. There was, I think, Lotus Notes at some point, but uh, that had a very different history compared to SQL in the end. So if you wanted to use SQL, you had to use IBM, and this is a textbook vendor lock-in situation. But it's also quite normal with a new invention like, like that. And when other vendors uh, saw the success of uh, relational databases and SQL in general, they started implementing their own, uh, they started uh, uh, implementing it into their own products. So we had Informix, Sybase, and a company called Relational Software Systems Incorporated, which is um, more well known as Oracle nowadays. They all came up with their own dialects of SQL and their own implementations of SQL as a query language. However, these were widely different if you compare them to each other. You couldn't just go and run a similar query across all of these different products yet alone to, to, to build an interaction uh, between them or for an application to be able to use both uh, at the same time. You still looked into very hard vendor lock-in when it comes to um, these these products. So the the intention of these vendors was to create the same kind of simplicity for their end users, but their intention was also to keep their users inside their uh, own uh, ecosystem or or using their own product rather than to implement something universally usable. So dozens of different ways uh, um, 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 got uh, implemented. And uh, while this was a start of something great, this is still not the world we live in uh, nowadays in terms of databases. So the big change came when SQL became an industry, an, an open standard, an ISO standard, and an ANSI standard uh, in uh, late in the late 90s, it was called SQL 86. And that was the first reference paper which outlined how SQL should behave, how SQL queries should look like, how it should interact with the database, what is the core functionality. Of course, features could be added, added on top of, of, of this standard, meaning that DB2 uh, must have been able to do uh, some, some uh, niche or different things compared to, to Informix, but the core feature set, the core query language was pretty much the same or at least similar. Many would tell me that, hey, Peter, you know, SQL is still not a universal dialect across some of the relational databases out there. And that's true. There are still dialects of SQL, but they are very, very, uh, very, very similar to each other compared to what we had uh, or they had in the in the in the uh, late uh, 70s, early 80s. So all of these vendors were still proprietary. This still meant vendor lock-in for the user when it comes to the these products themselves. But it was the start of something substantial. And what we mean by this substantial change or opportunity is that after SQL became an open standard and after um, machines became cheaper and, and uh, easier to run, open source projects started adopting SQL. Uh, Postgres, I think Alexi was uh, around the early 2000, no, the late 90s maybe when Postgres um, uh, implemented SQL. Before that, it was not available uh, on Postgres either. Um, but the open standard meant that SQL is now available to be used and implemented by anyone. And there was agreement on the core feature set. So this is why we see that there are hundreds of successful SQL derivatives on the market. And this is why it can happen that there are multiple different choices. If we go back uh, to the diagram I showed earlier, there are multiple different choices uh, for relational databases. So now we understand what happened to SQL and the history of SQL and how uh, all these derivatives came to exist and how there is relative democracy 
uh, on the uh, uh, in the uh, relational database arena. And uh, we might think that this is a story from the 70s or, or the 80s, and that's pretty much it. Uh, but it seems like history repeated itself. So Alexi, what's up with uh, the MongoDB query language or MongoDB itself as a technology? Yeah, so MongoDB got wolf by fire because saying, okay, you can just take an object in your favorite language, which is, of course, JavaScript, and just show it into the database, read it back. You don't need to think all those normal forms, all this relationship, building indexes. It all works automatically. Of course, it didn't. And then indexes appeared, and now you have to think of your schema a bit to make proper indexes. But overall, yeah. If you work with objects in your programming language, it's much easier to think about them as objects you get and save in the database, not as tables and some relationship between them. So they develop its open source database initially, I believe, under AGPL v3 license. And then they develop a query language called MongoDB query language, which actually two different languages, one of them is old style query language and the new one is a creation pipeline and they're not compatible, but I digress. So let's say it's just one simple query language and you don't, again, you just run MongoDB, it works fast, of course, as I say, by default, you don't need a DBA, you don't need to tweak configuration, you just put it on a large box with a lot of memory because the initial storage was heavily backed by memory mapped files. And it achieved a market dominance because marketing was great, uh, software was good, it was free for more any use cases. There was some commercial support, open source, all great. And then they changed the license to become proprietary and under SSPL, and they even tried to say, okay, we actually open source, we are not approved by open source initiative and we don't conform to open source definition, but let's say it's close enough to open source the source code is on GitHub, therefore it's open source, not source available or anything like that. So we kind of in the same situation where the single vendor dictates the same query language format and what they do is everyone should follow. So let's see if there are some other alternative to MongoDB and MongoDB query languages. So there are some uh, proprietary solutions that implement this query language, which is like, Oracle, uh, what's the name? Oracle Database API for MongoDB. Quite a strange name, but at least nice logo. Uh, Azure Cosmos DB, Document DB from Amazon, and also Gauss DB. And all of them implement a subset of MongoDB query language. They are all proprietary. They have incompatibilities between each other. They support different features. and. Once you pick one of, of it, you probably it's not very easy to migrate to some other. You can export your data, you can import your data, but you have to update your software to don't use features the other backend does not implement. So could we make an open star standard of, of out of MongoDB query language? Or is maybe MongoDB query language is open standard by itself already? So it's documented, it uh, could be standardized, some core features from MongoDB query language could be extracted. And uh, it supports JSON query language model. So you probably know that under the hood, JSON is used by, but that's more or less an optimization of JSON with additional data types. The whole object structure is still very similar to JSON. And it could be extended and expands on portability. For example, if you want to add some additional fancy vector search capabilities to your MongoDB compatible backend, you could always do that and then wait for those capabilities to be standardized by the standardization process. And then if uh, everyone is interested to support the query language the same and then build extension on top of it, you can ensure portability between products you don't have you still have to import export your data, of course, but you don't have to update your software to support the new subset of the query language. Could be extended with additional commands. And then uh, there are multiple competing vendors um, working on the same standard. So that all should be very good for users in Ethereum. But does it happen in practice? Well, no, because right now there's a single vendor that makes everything 
tooling, frameworks, applica applications that use MongoDB that uses tools. So, so far there is only MongoDB. So with the, so with, with, with having a similar situation at hand, uh, as we looked at the history of SQL and, and, and how it looked like in the eighties, um, it kind of looked similar where there are a lot of different proprietary solutions, which are attempting to mimic the behavior of MongoDB, but is it, is this really sustainable? Can the whole industry keep running after MongoDB to create alternatives just to just to uh, to keep up uh, innovation and 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 stop vendor locking from 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 happening. Just to, to clarify uh, what MongoDB compatibility is. So MongoDB compatibility is aiming towards the ability to reuse existing elements of the MongoDB ecosystem. MongoDB compatibility is not like uh, uh, creating a whole different query language and features from thin air. So developers would need to relearn everything and re, uh, re um, uh, develop tools and, and, and frameworks which are currently using uh, MongoDB. Uh, the aim of MongoDB compatible products is to leverage the existing elements of the MongoDB ecosystem. For example, if you have a nice UI application uh, to, to manage MongoDB as a database, with the MongoDB alternatives such as FerretDB or DocumentDB or the others, you could connect with the same tool to these alternatives and achieve the same thing. In theory, in practice, since there are differences between these products, this is not always um, not always uh, possible. So uh, Alexi mentioned some of the alternatives. Of course, there are a lot more than four alternatives. These are the more serious ones, focusing on becoming a MongoDB alternative. But uh, of course, many others appeared on the market. We talked about IBM before. IBM's Informix, believe it or not, is MongoDB compatible or claims MongoDB compatibility. But of course, this is more like aimed at current Informix users uh, seeking some, uh, some uh, MongoDB uh, compatibility. And uh, I think we talked about this, uh, Alexi. So all of these uh, uh, alternatives have vastly different feature sets, a different degree of compatibility. And of course, uh, for a MongoDB alternative, MongoDB sets the pace. MongoDB comes up with the features and then the alternatives are implementing them the exact same way as how it happened with SQL back then before it became an open standard. So, in the past 30 minutes, uh, we tried to talk about the why. Why did we start discussing that there should be an alternative uh, to MongoDB, an open source one, uh, which would decrease some of the risks users are taking by having a single vendor and alternatives which are not compatible with each other, or also they come with some vendor lock-in, like, uh, like uh, being tied to a cloud provider, like in the case of Cosmos DB, for example. So the, this is the reason why we started working on Ferret DB, to see if we can achieve some change when it comes to the MongoDB database market in general, to see if we can do the same thing as what SQL went through the, the, the innovation, the standardization, and the, the appearance of many different derivatives, which serve users much better than one single option out there. This is why we started working in FerretDB. It was, I think, Alexi, when we first uh, talked, it was 2021, middle of 2021-ish. That's when we started discussing the possibility that we may be able to do this with uh, Postgres as a database uh, or storage uh, storage uh, uh, engine. 
where we would not come up with a whole new database. We would not come up with uh, something uh, from scratch, but we would create a compatibility layer on top of Postgres, which would enable users to interact with Postgres the same way as uh, they would with MongoDB. And it would offer the MongoDB compatibility discussed earlier, where you can reuse your frameworks, your UI, UIs. You don't have to learn anything uh, new, really. You, you just have uh, uh, more alternatives as a user. So we started FerraDB in 2021, around July. Uh, Alexi, you single-handedly wrote the uh, first tag demo, which was, what was that capable of? Yeah, it was called MongoDB, and it was, yeah, it's super basic that operations, find, insert, that they deletes. So you could, uh, what we did, we ported the simplest to-do application, which was an example of uh, MariaDB's max scale to FerdB. So you could just uh, switch MongoDB or max scale to, to MongoDB back then, and it would work as, is, as before. Yes, that's a good thing you mentioned MongoDB. That's that's what we were called back then, where we just wanted to name the project, uh, you know, somehow. And uh, I think uh, uh, one of the reasons why we chose MongoDB is because, well, obviously MongoDB comes into mind, uh, but second what was even uh, uh, stronger as a reason is because back then we did some uh, trip to Pakistan to the Himalaya mountains and we ate a lot of mangoes uh, at that time. So uh, mangoes were very close to, to our hearts. Uh, Peter Zaitsev was also with us at, at, at this point and we, um, we came together, the three of us, to see whether this project would would uh, would uh, get any traction and then you uh, you um, published the tech demo on github around when was that alexi i think it was november the first yeah. november the first and uh, i remember i was uh, yeah i i was in spain at that time at a restaurant and uh, uh, I knew that Alexi published MangoDB on, on GitHub, but uh, what followed after was uh, completely out of this world in terms of traction because we got, I don't know, 3,000 stars on GitHub in one or two days, right? Uh, yeah, we were on the front page of Hacker News for maybe one and a half days, multiple times uh, also, and then some users started reaching out from large enterprise companies saying, hey, this is something we need tomorrow. Can you do that for us? And, uh, you know, Alexi, that's when we started sweating a little bit. Like, you know, we were nowhere near uh, completion uh, uh, those times. Uh, so since then, we changed the name. Of course, we are now FerretDB. Um, we... Um, we, of course, had a very different uh, opinion uh, or plan on how to move forward with the project, but we moved forward with it, seeing all this uh, great traction uh, we, we, we were uh, seeing from the, from the user side. So just to, uh, to, um, to make a short intro here uh, to FerretDB, so our plan was to create an alternative to MongoDB, which is open source and can be used without restrictions. That's why we chose Apache 2.0 after having some internal uh, licensing flame war uh, <laughs> in the- As in mandatory the, by open source project, yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course, we couldn't, we couldn't skip that. So with Peter, uh, Alexi and I, we were discussing all of these uh, licensing questions and uh, and the general direction and what we agreed on as values, of course, is that it's going to be Apache 2.0, it's going to be open source, it could be used on-prem or in the cloud, it would be based on Postgres. And Alexi, uh, tell us a bit more about the architectural uh, 
um, foundations. Yeah, so as I said, the idea is that you could take any application that uses MongoDB or other MongoDB compatible servers as DocumentDB and uses with FileDB. And for that, you need two pieces of software. First of all, you need the database itself, and second, you need database drivers, the one which is responsible for storing and retrieving your objects in the database. Uh, let's go to the previous slide. Yeah, so we still use MongoDB drivers mostly because they already exist and they are licensed under Apache 2.0, but also because we don't want you to change your application. So you can take any application you want, even the ones that you don't have source code for, and then swap MongoDB for FireDB. And everything should just work if, of course, we implement everything this application needs uh, and also without bugs. So yeah, we kind of think that MongoDB drivers are good because of good license and uh, developer experience is quite good, but also if you have to go inside those drivers, you will see a lot of hurdles, to be honest. And we, of course, had to go inside drivers to implement all the compatibility as needed. But from the outside, they're very nice, easy. Just put object into the database, read it from the database. All, all is great. And FireDB provides a compatible, uh, compatibility layer between those drivers and the backend, which is, was initially Postgres, and Postgres still is our main backend. So why we choose Postgres? Because it's uh, also free and open source software as FireDB, even under more permissive license than FireDB itself. And it has huge and supportive community and also quite old community, meaning that database is already stable and all bugs are well, already removed. And that that's still not the case, I would say, with MongoDB. I still have some problems that PostgreSQL developers think, okay, that's just a uh, growing pains because PostgreSQL is much, much more older and stable database. Uh, many users already run both PostgreSQL and MongoDB side by side because some application work with MongoDB and some application use PostgreSQL. And existing JSON capabilities in PostgreSQL are also great. They don't only support storing JSON documents naturally, but also support indexing them. And that's important for us to be able to quickly retrieve those documents. And uh, yeah, a lot of people who run PostgreSQL have a lot of experience running it. And also they have negative experience of running MongoDB because of very different storage engine and different operations requirements. And, then if you're an expert on running PostgreSQL, you could just want to run only PostgreSQL and don't care about how to run MongoDB. Yeah, so there are many compatible databases with PostgreSQL, such as Percon distribution of PostgreSQL, Timescale, CoCroach, HugoBioDB, and also, of course, multiple services that run PostgreSQL as service for you. So basically, um, you can turn these services or these products into MongoDB with, with running FireDB on top of it, right? Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, of course, the question which uh, we, we've been asked is, okay, why do we need MongoDB compatibility layer at all? So PostgreSQL supports uh, JSON B and JSON, JSON B data types, and you can do everything natively. You can store JSON documents effectively. You can retrieve them effectively. The thing is, you have to rewrite all your stack. You have to use a different driver. You have to rewrite your application. You have to rewrite all dependencies if they use MongoDB or use different dependencies if uh, if possible, and so on and so on. And our idea is like to be compatible with all those framework software out of the box. So, for example. Uh, Meteor stack, uh, which is the one stack used by Meteor JS framework, they rely heavily on MongoDB, and it's not, not easy for them to switch away from it. And of course, uh, they have problems with MongoDB license right now, so we are working on supporting all the features of the Meteor framework to be compatible with it, and then allow them to switch, uh, actually not them, but their users to switch between MongoDB and FireDB transparently. 
Yeah, so we, uh, PostgreSQL is our main backend and PostgreSQL compatible to the basis our main focus, but we also just recently released a version 1.10, which adds support for SQL backend. And that would be, could be interesting for you if you don't want to run a separate backend process, so you can run just a single FRDB process on Raspberry Pi, uh, very low, I mean, Raspberry Pi, not the Raspberry Pi 4, which is like, has a lot of computing power, but something like Raspberry Pi 1 or Raspberry Pi 0, which is quite old and constrained device, but you still can run for RDB there with a SQLite backend. And if you don't have a lot of data and don't require some extra features like advanced indexes and so on, that would be a good use case for you. We already have customers, users who run for RDB with a SQLite and they're happy with it. And we also partner with uh, SAP HANA, and they are working, and we are working with them to provide a, a HANA backend for FLDB. Yeah, and of course, uh, it is uh, also possible for anyone in the community to contribute their own backend, and with our help, we could integrate it into FLDB, and then if there is interest in on supporting an alternative additional backends, for example, MySQL is a new architecture that we did as a part of our work on SQL, that also should be much, much easier than before. So if there is enough interest, in, please do that. We could help. Yeah, so as far as I remember, Alexi, correct me if I'm wrong. So we started with Postgres. This was our database of choice. <clears throat> and then how we how we ended up supporting SQLite is because, well, you made the case. So the community, you know, there are many contributors, many followers uh, of, of FerretDB uh, constantly giving us feedback, and SQLite was right on top of the 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 priorities uh, submitted by the by the community and by users. You know, you just wanted something which is easier to use. It's a lower footprint, and um, and that's why we decided to to um, rework our backend architecture, make it much easier to to add new database engines, uh, supported databases for FerretDB, and this is how we 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 uh, came up with uh, SQLite, and now it's in production uh, so 1.10 our latest release is the first production version version of sqlite and what's very important is we keep parity as much as we can between postgres and sqlite so um so uh so this uh, this is uh, going to be a, a similar experience uh, with 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 both of these uh, database engines when using ferretdb and SAP HANA, they just decided to contribute uh, to FerretDB. They were interested enough to, to contribute to FerretDB to start building out their own uh, SAP HANA support into FerretDB. Uh, and this further underlines that it is um, possible to add uh, new database backends to, 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 uh, to FerretDB. However, we always stress this uh, out. Uh, we are focusing on Postgres, so that is our number one um, number one uh, goal to to increase compatibility with uh, with uh, using Postgres. But of course, uh, we understand that there are other use cases uh, needed by the community. So uh, I would rather not conclude at this point. Uh, we established that there is a need for an open standard for MQL. Uh, we think that MongoDB will become the same commodity as SQL as soon as it becomes an open standard or as soon as vendors come together. And we want to lead this effort. We want to do this big push towards uh, that to, to happen. And uh, of course, uh, as uh, as we mentioned earlier, with the uh, in connection with the, the database engines, we build FerretDB with the community. So yes, we are a company. Yes, we have a core team. We actually have a core team of ten people at this point. Uh, we have brilliant uh, engineers like Elena, Patrick, Chi, um, and uh, God, I should not. Uh, I, I never should start uh, naming people because I'm going to. To, to miss uh, anybody out. So this is by no means uh, uh, 
a full list, but we have brilliant engineers working for us on FaradDB. But what's great uh, here is that the community also started picking up issues, started executing on the roadmap. Uh, they 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 give us uh, feedback, and this is how we 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 come up with the roadmap and our priorities. So we have one question, uh, Vishal, uh, uh, who asked uh, actually two questions. How close is FerretDB to MongoDB for production use cases? And do we have an Atlas alternative? So with that, let's look at the roadmap and let's discuss the current state of, of uh, FerretDB. Alexi, I think, uh, Let's both unmute ourselves because uh, I think uh, uh, all of us will uh, have to pitch in here just to start answering your question, uh, Vishal. And this is a great question, and this is what most uh, users are interested in. So it's hard to create an alternative out of thin air because theoretically you would need to implement all features in order to be the exact same thing as MongoDB. Right, but we also know that this is not something which is possible. Uh, how we started uh, developing FerretDB is we started with the core features, like the core features of any database, uh, getting data in and out of uh, the database itself. And then we started implementing features which are special when it comes to MongoDB and how users uh, use MongoDB. And we pretty much come up with these things based on user feedback, right, Alexi? Yeah, so I would say that FerdDB is production ready simply because we have users who use FerdDB in production. If it's production ready for you, only you could answer. So if you throw FerdDB at applications that uses all features of MongoDB 6 or 7, I forget, so of course it's not compatible because we know there are some features that are not supported by FerdDB just yet. But if your subset is small and relatively like you don't use all exotic features of uh, MongoDB, then it might it might be already compatible for you or not. We have a documentation that describes how to test your application, but, but in a nutshell, you can just run your application against FerdDB, and FerdDB has a special mode called proxy mode where all received commands are being handled themselves, but also, Peter, sorry, you're sharing Slack right now. And, yeah, and then uh, also sent to MongoDB and uh, results compared and locked. So if there is a difference in the responses between MongoDB and FerdDB, it will be locked. And there are also some metrics that allow you to understand what comments are not implemented, what arguments are not implemented, what if uh, there were some errors and so on and so on. So we have that tooling, it's, it's documented, it was recently documented, so you can take a look and then decide if it's compatible for you or not. But I would suggest uh, the simplest solution might be to just run it and see, and then if something is not compatible, create new issues, vote for existing issues, so we could prioritize them. Want to talk about Atlas? Uh, let's tackle Atlas uh, later. Uh, let's keep talking about how FerretDB can become compatible with your own use case. So, uh, so the essence of uh, how we are coming up with our roadmap and features is that uh, we have users who would test uh, FerretDB either by using the tools uh, Alexi mentioned, or maybe they just uh, try it out. And then, and then it becomes clear to us, for example, meteor applications are, are um, meteor applications are, are, are a good example. So we are compatible with meteor as a framework and all the sample applications would work and some real world applications would work as well. But for example, there's a, an, a deprecated uh, feature called oplog. It's deprecated by MongoDB. So it's, it's, it's actually no longer supported or will no longer be supported by MongoDB itself. But as we found, Oplog and Meteor applications, they basically uh, just, uh, just uh, cannot, uh, cannot be uh, without uh, each other. Uh, Oplog is sorely needed by Meteor applications 
to create the real time uh, updates on the on the UI uh, as far as we understand and therefore we may say, okay, Meteor as a framework is compatible with FaradDB, but at the end of the day, many Meteor applications would miss Oplog as a feature, and therefore they uh, specific uh, specific uh, applications using the Meteor framework are still not compatible with uh, FaradDB. And this is very well, similar. Te technically, a Meteor would fall back to Polling. So Oplog is a list of oper operation log. Oplog stands for operation log. It's a list of operations like what objects were updated, created, and so on. If, op if Oplog is not available for any reason, Meteor, DB, Meteor framework, what it does, it basically pulls the database to see if there are any changes. So technically, that automatic switching works without any AO involved, any on the outside. So Meteor applications work. They don't work if you have enough data, so queries are slow. So you can say in production, deployment, it is a compatible one depending on amount of data, depending on amount of users, traffic, and so on and so on. So if I run some complex application that doesn't use, again, every single feature of Meteor and MongoDB, then it works if I use it by myself. If the company of me, you know, hundreds of people, then it would not work probably. Right on. So, so it's it's complicated, uh, of course. However, as we move forward with our uh, roadmap, it will be less and less uh, complicated for users to adopt FaradDB simply because most of the commonly used features will naturally be there. So the more applications we can test, the better we can understand what uh, the priorities are in terms of missing features and what we would need to develop. And of course, having this roadmap out in the open. So this is uh, 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 um, an openly available uh, project uh, or uh, roadmap uh, anyone, can, uh, anyone can take a look at on, on GitHub. Um, this is this is the 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 full list of uh, the features we are working on along with with the statuses and also we have uh, um, a tracker dedicated to dedicated to those applications who which were reported to us as uh, applications which would benefit from from FaradDB sometimes or well, most of the time by their developers and this is what uh, you can see there uh, for example if you take uh, NodeDB uh, we can instantly take a look at which uh, features are already uh, implemented in FaradDB and uh, where are the the um, missing features? What are these, and and uh, what is the status of it? Uh, you would be able to see a lot of not readies here. So not ready means that the uh, issue is not ready to be picked up by a community member. Uh, but by all means, we are making progress with uh, a number of these different applications. And also, since we are an open source uh, project. Uh, it is very hard to tell uh, how many users of FaradDB are out there. Every single day we learn about someone who uses FaradDB for something we did not even uh, think of, and uh, they either uh, end up on this list uh, or not. So this is by far not an exhaustive uh, list of all the applications we are working towards uh, supporting. Uh, all in all, uh, to answer the uh, questions here, uh, yes, FaradDB is production ready, as Alexi mentioned, but production readiness also depends on your use case and whether the feature is available. And sometimes these missing features are uh, not taking a very long time to implement. Sometimes it's even like what the, the fastest I've seen so far, Alexi, was maybe an hour or something where a tweak was needed for an application to work. And of course, sometimes, like in the case of Oplog, many months of work uh, would be needed to get through all of the prerequisites and all of the, um, all of the uh, roadblocks uh, uh, we need to um, work through. Uh, Second question I'm seeing here, do we have a MongoDB Atlas alternative? 
So MongoDB Atlas is not just a database. It's a comprehensive development platform with a lot of uh, different um, features. I'm getting more sun here than I, uh, than I like. Uh, so a lot of uh, features are present in uh, MongoDB Atlas, which are not even uh, connected to database workloads, but search capabilities or, or uh, any, any other feature which would aid the fast development of applications. So if you're using MongoDB Atlas to the fullest extent possible, and probably you will never have a MongoDB Atlas alternative. You will not be able to migrate from MongoDB Atlas to something else simply because it's, we don't think it is possible to replicate the full behavior of MongoDB Atlas along with, uh, with, with, with all, of its, uh, all of its functionality. But at the same time, this is when you would need to consider whether using MongoDB Atlas to this fullest extent is a good idea. Because at the end of the day, if you're using MongoDB Atlas and all of its features, not just as a database, then uh, you are getting yourself into a vendor lock-in situation. And uh, that means that whenever MongoDB decides to change the pricing or deprecate features, like in the case of Oplog, um, then you would have a hard time uh, moving somewhere else because you depend so much on something which is only provided by one single vendor. So again, to answer this question, we will never become a full alternative to MongoDB Atlas, but that is by design. Uh, that is due to the fact that MongoDB Atlas is a lot more than a database. On the other hand, we are uh, planning uh, to start FerretDB as a service, uh, first with uh, our partners, whom I can't talk about at this point, but uh, uh, some of uh, uh, our database as a service uh, provider partners are working on launching FerretDB as a service on their own platforms. And they may have some of the functionality which you are using on MongoDB Atlas, which you can keep using with, uh, with, uh, with, with these uh, new MongoDB alternatives uh, popping up as a, as a service using FerretDB, of course, to, to create that MongoDB compatibility. Um, Alexi, not sure if you want to add anything to that. I just hope that no one uses all functionality of MongoDB Atlas because it's huge, but also yeah, because of vendor locking. You have to be a real, real enthusiast of MongoDB and then why you're enthusiast of big public company that doesn't care about you. Well, to, to each of their own, of course. So we don't... Yeah, unless you're a shareholder, of course. <laughs> well, uh, so... I'm 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 usually I'm usually very uh, supportive of all kinds of ways of thinking. I would not sleep very well if I would rely on one single vendor. That's for sure. Let me give you an example. Uh, many know this about me. Uh, I'm using Microsoft Windows. It's a, it's an OS. I'm happy with it, but. If for some reason Microsoft would introduce changes which would no longer be uh, acceptable to me as a user, I would, I would, I would probably be able to move off of Windows to some other OS in a matter of hours simply because there is nothing special about Windows to me. I'm not using functionality which does not exist in. Ubuntu or some other OSs or even OSX. I was an OSX or uh, yes, OSX user for, for a couple of years. That means that I don't feel I'm in a vendor locking situation. But if you're using MongoDB Atlas and all of its features, I really don't know what the alternative uh, would, would be. Um, that's, that's, that's food for, food for uh, thought. Also, we are not here to um we are not here to to uh challenge mongodb atlas in a sense of how 
easy to use it is uh, for many other use cases other than a database. We want to provide an alternative and whether you will be happy with the feature set of that alternative or not depends on the amount of feedback you are, uh, you are giving us. So for example, if it would turn out that FaraDB would be used in conjunction with search capabilities uh, most of the time, then we would be looking into what open source search uh, solution could be paired with FaraDB and, and uh, whether this could be provided as a, as, a, as a service. So we are not against anything, but creating creating a 100% uh, alternative to Atlas doesn't seem to be feasible, nor does it sound like a good idea. I guess that's how, uh, that's how I would summarize. Okay, let's uh, look at the, yes, uh, based on the time here, we are severely over time. There are a couple more questions. I either got, I, I also got some private messages here. So I would be more than happy to answer any questions you may have about FaraDB. I think Alexi uh, 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 is, uh, is also uh, ready to do that. We have a, a Slack community, uh, an open Slack uh, community. It's faraddb.slack.com where you can uh, get in touch with us or also please uh, um, test your application, provide us feedback on GitHub. And uh, we are hoping that, um, that the achievement we are proud of that FaraDB is production ready after two years of hard work on it together with the, uh, with the community will continue and uh, will uh, we'll be uh, an even easier alternative to, to, to uh, those looking for replacements or alternatives to, to MongoDB itself. And uh, with that, uh, I think this is how we conclude as uh, long as Alexi is not planning to make any comments. No, no, thank you. All right, then. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, as a reminder, uh, next um, next uh, month, we will have a panel discussion on SSPL. Uh, you can uh, sign up for that event on documentdatabase.org. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, hoping that uh, we, will, we will be able to uh, discuss SSPL uh, not just in this uh, very short uh, form as, as we were able to today due to time constraints, but if you would like to understand how SSPL may affect you, then, uh, then uh, you are welcome to register to, to, the, to the webinar. It will be on the 6th of October and the address is documentdatabase.org. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about uh, FaraDB and uh, our progress and the state of document databases. The recording will be available on, on YouTube and we are hoping to see you on more uh, document database community ev events in the future. Take care, everyone. Have a great day ahead and see you next time. Thank you. Bye.